So welcome everyone. Uh, you are at Montana State University Food Product Development Lab. I am the director of this lab. And here you can see our students and lab managers that are all helping and setting up things for our showcase today. So our lab focuses on sustainable food product development, which what we think is about making the food not only tasty and can make a profit, but also is healthy to both humans in the cultural, economic, and um, societal way, but also healthy to the environment. Low carbon footprint, low water usage, low electricity usage, low um, environmental impact. So my lab has uh, currently three major projects. The first one being pulse product development. So you guys know what pulse are? Like lentils, chickpeas, dry peas, beans. So we try to incorporate pulse into the food products that we normally have that normally don't have pulses. Like for, for example, my students right now developing a lentil cracker using timeless seeds, organic lentils. You guys know about timeless seeds. Yeah, they're very generous. They wanted to partner with us. So uh, right now we're running a 30-day marathon trained sensory panel meeting one hour a day, every day with same 12 panelists for them to taste the crackers every single day and to tell us what's the flavor profile, texture profile of the cracker so that they can determine which cracker is more beany, which cracker is more burned, which cracker has more gritty texture. And that we profile the sensory fingerprint in order to know the differences in sensory profile of different crackers. And then we pair it with consumer data. Consumers say, oh, I like this, I don't like that, I like this. Very straightforward so that we can pair these two and see what makes a cracker more popular. Is it more burnt flavor? Is it less uh, beany? Is it more crunchy texture? So that's the example of our Pulse product development. Um, the second research that we're working on is Farm to Campus. So uh, shout out to Kara Landovi, our uh, big supporter to this project. We partner with rural Montana food enterprises uh, that want to sell their product to MSU Culinary Services. Uh, one example that we have been working with since 2017 yeah, is the cream of the West. So they're in Hollerton, like one and a half hour north from here. And we met each other in the Montana Food Show. And they said, oh, you're a food scientist, so you can help me. Uh, later on, you'll he we'll hear more about the project. But basically, they told me that their pancake is kind of chewy and dry. They said that for some reason, it just dry out really fast. So we look into it and realize that it's actually not dry because it's the same moisture content as the commercial pancake. But people just complain about it being dry. So we look into how the internal structure and texture of this pancake, uh, it seems to be coarser, it's denser, it has a lot of grains because it's seven grains, so you can literally chew the grains. So those combination of the pancake structure make people feel dry. So instead of focusing on the moisture, we focus on the internal structure by using different engineering and processing procedure. The pancake became fluffy and moist, given that the moisture content from the beginning to the end is all the same. So that's one example that we work with Smoke Command. The other example is working with the Gluten Free Prairie. They have their granola, breakfast granola that is kind of crumbly. So we try to fix the sugar coating system to so make it a bit more sticky and therefore all like still come club together. The third research that we work on, I feel like I'm at a podium and talking to my students. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the third research um, our lab focuses on is indigenous food product development. So by saying indigenous, we want to explore native ingredients, whether it's domestic here uh, with Native American communities or it's internationally with other indigenous communities. We try to know what are some native plants that are still there that people just ignore or use less and less because they start domesticate more commercial crops? So one example, we partner with Senegal smallholder farmers, predominantly our women, that they grow a lot of peanuts and they just sell it as is. They didn't add value. And that was really low sale price. So we work with them to see if we can use this peanut to make a value-added product. And in this case, we make a peanut cake. Uh, interestingly, in Senegal, very rural area, they don't have running water, they don't have electricity, they don't have paved road. Everybody eats French bread. So that's how much the uh, colonization influence on them. So they rarely use 
their native ingredients in a way that is value added processed. So we partner with them and see, okay, if we were going to use their native plants, for example, African wild mango or the baobab tree, which are widely grown, which uh, they cannot domesticate yet, but it's like grown everywhere. Can we utilize those and add it into the peanut cake and enhance the nutrition and also enhance their uh, value of their product? And the other project that uh, you also also listened to uh, Steve presentation a little bit is working with native fish keepers. Anybody uh, from Polson or nearby area? Oh, there's one person. That's great. So um, native fish keepers is probably owned and operated business that they try to capture invasive species, lake trout, from the Flathead Lake, and make process them into frozen fillet and sell it to support this nonprofit because they capture the invasive species so that they can help reduce those number and maintain the ecosystem in the lake. And we try to partner with them to develop, again, a value-added product from that frozen fillet. So this year, my students are trying a smoked lake trout, adding native ingredients. So we well, had a field trip and worked with the community members and asked them what are some ingredients that are native around here that you would recommend adding into the trout. So um, the ultimate goal is to promote the business of the native fish keepers so that they can say, hey, here's the fillet and here's the recipe of the native ingredients using native ingredients to make the smoked trout. So that is a very brief overview of what our lab is currently doing. Uh, we're always w um, welcoming partners or student researchers that are interested in doing sustainable food product development. And I will give the time to our lab manager and she's going to lead you to various activities from now. Any questions? Yes. What was the product that you were doing with the fish, the value product? Uh, it's a smoked lake trout. So what, we, what were you doing to add that? So um, if we didn't do the smoked trout, it's just a frozen fillet. And then they, you're available to, uh, you, can, you can buy it uh, from town and country, I think. Town and country and co-op. And also our camp farm to campus program serve that. Uh, we're trying to brine it with native ingredient, for example, maple syrup, or even the chestnut powder during the brining, and then you smoke it. And after that, you can season it with different uh, native species like sumac or elderberries or juniper berries to add flavor and add some twist to some typical uh, smoked trout. When a company approaches you, you talked about all of the sustainability principles and the, the criteria. What, I guess, how far, how busy are you? Would you be able to take out any company? What are the other criteria for partnering with the company? Uh, we currently partner with the companies that have interest or are currently providing food through the Farmers Campus Initiative. Uh, it's very interesting that recently there are two other companies that they're not through Pharma Campus, but they also are interested in improving their product. And we haven't figured out the best way to work with them yet, but I'm still always open. And we're right now literally talking to each other and see how we can work together. Because without an established uh, mechanism of serving food through Pharma Campus, uh, there's some more like IP management and uh, where the research is going to be done and ownership of this project resolved a lot of other moving pieces that is a bit more complicated, but I think it's still very meaningful to work with other company, even if they're not in farm to campus, because they also are part of Montana. Yeah. Thank, you. yeah. thank you. Thank you for asking. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Hilburn, and I am a junior in chemical engineering, and I have been working uh, with Dr. Kuo in her food product development lab since my freshman year of college. So this is my third year uh, being involved. Um, and today, I would like to talk to you a little bit um, about my research and tying that back into um, the general uh, direction of our lab and like what we aim to do uh, with student research and supporting local producers. Um, so a question I get asked a lot is, wait, you're in engineering, why are you in a food product lab? And my answer to that is, I went into engineering uh, because I've always loved math and science. It's something that's just clicked with me. Um, and so it uh, was a very clear uh, field for me to go into. Um, and it also 
allowed me the opportunity to work with people and work with communities um, and that's always something that's been really important to me um, and because of that uh, working in Dr. Quo's lab was a perfect fit. It stood out to me um, my freshman year when I was looking into different labs and research projects um, because what's really unique about the lab is that um, we work on sustainable food product development and work directly with um, local producers and consumers in the community, which is something that you don't always get in research labs. A lot of times it's just confined to the research, um, but our research involves um, in the lab and also talking with producers and local communities, which is something um, that I really love and think is super important um, in science that we uh, use it to benefit the world around us. Um, and so basically, long story short, uh, that's why I applied to work in Dr. Quo's lab and why I think it's uh, really special. So my project um, specifically has been dealing with cream of the West seven grain pancake mix. So Cream of the West approached Dr. Quo in the fall of 2017 and said, hey, we have this seven grain pancake mix um, that was being carried in the MSU dining halls, um, except they had to stop carrying it because it just wasn't doing well in a dining hall setting. Uh, sitting out um, in like a tray waiting to be served, they would just get like really hard and like crusty and not something that was super palatable to students. So the dining hall had to stop carrying them, uh, which obviously was a big bummer for Cream of the West. So they approached us and asked, um, hey, could you help us improve this product? Because something that we do here in the lab is work with local producers because, you know, Cream of the West is a company of three people. They don't have the time or the resources to be able to say, okay, like, let's stop everything, look into why this product isn't working and improve it. Um, and so that's where someone like us can come in and help them with that. Um, and MSU has this really awesome program called Farm to Campus, um, where they work on sourcing local products um, to bring into the MSU dining halls, uh, which is something that's very unique um, for a university. And um, as you can see, it has a really large positive impact on the Montana food system community. Over $1.75 million were invested through this program into uh, Montana food systems just in 2018, and that is quite a large amount of money. And Culinary Services serves over 12,000 students a day, which is a very large amount of people, and that puts universities in a very unique position to be able to give a platform to local producers. Um, and so, um, Farm to Campus is very closely aligned with what our goals are um, in the lab. And so we reached out to Carl and Dolphy, who is the leader of Farm to Campus, um, and talked to her a bit about like, hey, like how can we work together and collaborate um, in the lens of this Cream of the West seven grain pancake mix? Um, and Kara said, if there was a resource such as a food innovation center where companies could be directed to develop and improve their food products to meet the demands that we have for them for items. We could potentially continue to increase the amount of local food that we already have. Um, and so basically what this is saying is we really want to support local producers, but as with um, the Cream of the West pancakes, if the product isn't able to function properly in a dining hall setting, unfortunately, they can't carry the products. So where we're able to come together and partner is um, our lab can say, hey, you want to carry this product, but it doesn't work for reason X, Y, Z in dining halls. Well, what we can do is we can come in and help them improve that product so it can be carried in the dining halls. And so I started on my research into why the pancakes were not up to par for um, a dining hall setting. And at first we thought that the problem was moisture because a lot of consumers, when they ate the pancakes, their complaint was, oh, it's really dry. Um, and so we were like, okay, let's look at um, the moisture retention. And over here, uh, we have a photo of the Cream of the West pancake on the left, and on the right is a typical Krusty's pancake, which is what they carry in the dining halls currently. Um, and when we actually measured the moisture loss over a certain amount of time in the pancakes, it wasn't 
different enough to um, for us to be able to say yes this is the source of the problem so we had to look into a different possibility which was texture um, and so what I did for a semester was I tested lots of different variables and lots of different uh, mixes and you can see some of them here such as soy flour buttermilk powder different oils different grains um, etc to see okay which one of these has the most positive impact on the texture of the pancake and what ended up being the uh, most reasonable solution for a small company to integrate into their pancakes and for a dry mix and had the most positive consumer response um, was changing the size of the grain. So what we ended up with was three different grain sizes uh, going from left to right, they get smaller. Um, and that was what we determined had the biggest positive impact on um, the texture of the pancakes. And at that point, we went into doing a hedonic scale acceptance test. So um, we had a day where right here in um, Hannon, we had 120 participants come in and try five different types of pancakes based on this change of grain size um, and had them rate them on um, a nine point hedonic acceptance scale. Um, and also we tested the impact of labeling products as locally sourced and containing seven grains uh, because that was something we're also interested in seeing how that um, is received by students and the consumer. Um, and so throughout the course of that day we made probably more pancakes than a normal person, person should ever make in their lifetime. But <laughs> we were successful and were able to get some really awesome data. Um, and so essentially um, what we can take from this graph was that the fine grind pancakes labeled as both locally sourced and as containing seven grains statistically received the same rating as the crusties pancake um, that was currently being carried in the dining hall. So that was something that was really awesome and that we'd love to see because you're like, wow, um, consumers respond just as positively to this local product as they do to this generic product. Um, and so right here is a side-to-side -side photo of the two. So there's the Crusty's pancake and the fine grind seven grain cream of the West pancake. And you can see they both have that um, very nice fluffy texture that we look for in pancakes. And so currently what we are working on is working with Cream of the West to implement what we found about decreasing the grain size into their production facility and hopefully reintegrating this product back into the Montana State Dining Halls. So it's helping Cream of the West and also um, providing farm to campus with another product that they can carry in their dining halls. Um, and also we are trying to start looking into how we can better educate students on the benefits of eating locally sourced sustainable food products. And I kind of want to bring this back to um, the community aspect of this and why this research is so important for Montana food systems and for our community. Um, Cream of the West is a company with three employees. That is not very many people. Um, however, it is a key part of their community in Harleton, Montana. Um, because what they do is they buy the grain products from all of the local farmers in that area and use those products or, or use that grain to create their products. And because of that, um, it's very important to all of the producers in their community that they are being successful so they can keep buying their grains. And this is something that we see all across the state of Montana. Our rural agricultural areas are vital to our state and to the communities in them and that is why it is really important that we use our opportunities as students and as research labs to support those producers. So basically what I just said, um, we're able to use this opportunity um, in our lab and have access to research to support these local producers and communities and in the meantime uh, us as students we also get the opportunity to learn more about science and apply our education um, and you know be able to put research on a resume and that sort of thing so it, all in all super great program and lab to be a part of so
Thank you. So we're going to talk about the importance of sensory studies today. Um, our sensory lab is devoted to making sure we've got um, good products coming out of Montana. We kind of want to make sure that Montana is recognized as an actual industrialized state instead of just thinking farms and ranches we can produce as well. So what is sensory science? Does anybody have an idea of what the definition is? So. How things feel or taste or taste Yeah, or definitely. So the exact term is a scientific discipline used to evoke, measure, analyze, and interpret those responses to products that are perceived by the senses of sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. So we have the five different senses. Um, these are different examples of what you see and how it affects your perception of foods. So if you're looking at the different colors of a beer, a darker, lighter, uh, stouts, or IPAs, those are all going to have different tastes, and you can analyze that based on what you've had before, the different colors associated with the tastes. For cheese curds, I always find this funny because I've never actually done cheese curds um, against my ear, but like squeakiness, uh, crunchiness, when you bite into something and it just snaps that crisp feeling. Um, or crisp sound, those are all different sounds that evoke a uh, response. The feeling, uh, crispiness of a potato chip with different textures, we have like crumbliness, soft, doughy, pasty. These are all things that you can use when you're analyzing a food. It doesn't just have to be touch, it can be taste. So texture goes on two levels. It's what you touch and how it hits your tongue. So if you're chewing something and it forms like a big uh, clump of food, that's like a pastiness, and you want a pastiness in certain foods, like if you're eating a peanut butter sandwich, you kind of expect it to do that. If you're drinking milk, that's probably not as good. You can tell if something has gone bad in that sense. And then with smell, buttery is a big smell. Um, I like to mention popcorn. I don't do a lot of pound cakes. But uh, just certain smells will automatically hit you, and then your salivary, salivary glance go out, and you're ready to have some food. That's what dog shops do. They just pipe the smell outside, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's what Disneyland does, too. They always pipe a smell out so you're ready to get their food. It's a very smart tactic. Um, six basic tastes. We've got sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, and fat was discovered as a taste. I have to amend this, it was in 2016, not 2017. So um, there is now a taste associated with, like, with the steak. You can specifically taste fat, they have found. And we're going to go through what constitutes as a taste, because there are different tastes and different smells, and they're yeah. uh, not exactly the same thing. So we are going to do the jelly bean challenge. Has anyone done this before? Yeah, you've done it. OK, so I'm going to bring a tray with jelly beans to you. Have your eyes closed and I am going to put it in front of you. I'm going to have you take that jelly bean and chew it without seeing what color it is and we're going to see if you can tell what taste it is. Sound good? Our so eyes are closed. Okay, I'm going to put this right here in front of you or I'll put it in your hands. I'll make it. Yes. I'm not going to eat it yet. Nope. We can all do it together. Okay, so let's chew it. And chew for about 10 seconds with, nose with your nose plugged. Oh. <laughs> that might have affected it. Should we try again? With our nose plugged. With your nose plugged. Did you guys get a scent before you plugged your nose? No. Okay. My bad on that one. Um, thanks for catching that. Okay. Does anybody have a flavor? Pure sugar. Pure sugar. <laughs> like, like, like cotton candy or something, you know, because it's just sugary. Exactly. Know? So you can either swallow it or spit it out. Um, take your hand off your nose real quick. What do you get? <laughs> yes, there were different flavors. Oh, they were. Okay. 
So your nose is 80% of your taste buds, is your olfactory nerves. We only have six different tastes. That's why you guys could smell and taste sugar, because we have sweet, salty, sour, bitter, savory, umami, fat. Those were your options for tasting. When you plugged your nose, you plugged off your olfactory nerves from getting that whiff of grape or lemon or cherry, and you couldn't decipher it. For smells, we can smell hundreds of compounds. So when you have cherry, there is literally just the flavor of sugar. It's sucrose mixed with the aroma for cherry. That's pretty cool, huh? So how does this affect us with sensory evaluations? Every product that you use, every product that's in your counter or in your refrigerator has gone through a sensory panel to determine the best recipe, the higher acceptance ratings, everything that a consumer wants. And the biggest thing consumers want is a good taste. 87% of people are willing to pay higher prices for better taste. This is a 2012 study on food and health. Um, it checked into what people at the grocery store were most likely to buy based off of. And people want a good taste. Next comes price, um, healthiness, convenience, and sustainability. So we want things that taste good, essentially, right? How can this be utilized by us? So like I said, everything that you have in your home has, been, has gone through extensive research to see if you're actually going to like it. We're one of the points of research before it hits the grocery store. So if you have an idea for a new product of food, you're going to first start with a recipe. You're going to start with multiple types of recipes with different ratios of each item. And then we're going to see what is the best one. So how you do that is you have a sensory panel. And we're doing that right now with lentil crackers. We have about 13 participants that are being trained to understand the differences in these lentil crackers. With the sensory panel, you're trained to understand the different textures, the different tastes, smells, feels of the food. So with lentil crackers, an example would be the or lentils, so we smell a very beany smell when you sniff it. And there's different levels of that. So you're picking the best product based on all of these factors that most people either like or don't like. Luckily, people are pretty basic. They either really like the same thing or really don't like the same thing a majority of the time. So when we do it, this is an example of a sensory panel. They have multiple items that they're checking. and What's going on here is everything is different, so you need to pick a taste of something and then have an example of it. So they're checking out the different examples, like if you said something was dusty, we could try like Oreo crumbs for dust and see if that was like a similar dustiness to the food that you're trying out. So we have different ways to explain everything. So I see like cornmeal as dust, Oreo crust as dust, cocoa powder as dust. And then they pick the best one that describes it the most accurately. So once they have all of these textures picked out, it can be a month, it can be months, um, it's all specific to the product too. Then they're going to go through and do a sensory taste test. So they're going to get multiple samples, however many samples the individual researcher created. Uh, we did a taste testing with pancakes last semester. I think there were about seven samples. So you got seven different recipes. Maybe there were 20 samples. And then we also check into if you're more likely to buy something that says made in Montana, if you're more likely to buy something that says non-GMO or organic. So there could be four different labelings for the same exact sample. We're going to see how you like that and what you're going to pick. So that is the sensory evaluation. And then they're going to pick a specific recipe. They're going to go through it maybe a few times, depending on how important the brand is or how like, they want to make sure they're on the mark. So it could be 120 people. It could be 1,000 people that do this study and see what you're most likely to buy in the store. Then it goes to production. Then it goes to the grocery store. Then it goes to your kitchen. 
And some of those identifiers that we talked about earlier, such as the um, different powders, they can be transmitted into marketing, such as fruity dinobites. If somebody came up with the term fruity and that was utilized a lot during the study, that's probably going to be one of the best ways that they're going to identify it when they're marketing. So how can we use this with um, the world and making it a better place to be and a healthier place to be? This is a uh, 2010 study on the sodium intakes throughout the different countries in the world. Can you see we're a little above what we're supposed to be? Uh, the World Health, Health it's, supposed to be, yeah. it's supposed to be right there. So the World Health Organization recommends five grams a day. We're um, seven to eight-ish, if we're lucky, like depending on the person. But um, can you guys think of any foods that are around five grams, 2,300 milligrams, that have been used recently to talk about salt? Because the big one is Subway. People think Subway is so healthy for them, but a lot of those foods, um, even though there's veggies in there, there's protein in there, um, a lot of it is preserved, and it has your daily salt intake in one six-inch sub. So we are trying to figure out different ways to lower sodium intake, which has a lot of health problems associated with it, hypertension, edema, just a whole slew of things. And we want to make sure that we lower the sodium intake without making people really upset with their taste buds. And we're gonna talk about that a little more in the presentation over here after you guys talk to Edwin with the texture analyzer demo. And that's what I've got for taste right now. So if you guys wanna head on over, we're gonna go see Edwin. Hi, my name is Edwin. I'm from Ghana in West Africa. And my project is on developing a peanut product for um, farmers in Senegal. And one of the variables we have to um, investigate is the texture of the peanut product. Because um, we had um, a focus group discussion in Senegal with the farmers, and they said they wanted a soft product. So, um, and when we went to Senegal also, we took, um, we took with us some peanut products. But this was the, the peanut product they liked the best. So this was like our control sample. So um, the texture, so they wanted the texture of the sample, the, the product we're going to develop for them to be similar to this, especially with texture. So luckily for us, we have a texture analyzer, and that's what we use to measure texture. So um, today I'm going to show you how we use the texture analyzer. No, that's, it's not granola bar. It's called a peanut baked square. It's made by Quakers. Yeah. Is it like a breakfast? Yeah, it's like a breakfast. Uh, you can say that, yeah. How would you describe the texture? It's, it's, it's kind of grainy, but it's soft inside. And it has like a layer of peanut butter inside, so it makes it like, so you bite into it and that spreads into your soft. mouth. It's a little soft inside. Is it like chewy or crunchy? Or? It's, it's chewy, not chewy. crunchy, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's more chewy because it's baked. So right. there's more fly in it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, the first thing we have to do is to um, calibrate the section analyzer. So we calibrate um, the height and we calibrate the force. And we use um, this lump of metal to calibrate it. Yeah. That's, is that software specific to that device? Yeah, it's specific to the device. So um, it's using a load cell right now of 50 kilograms. And um, we use um, a load of 2 kilograms to just calibrate the force to make sure that... Um, so this is the probe, and that's what's going to bite into the product. So we want to make sure that the probe has like um, a weight, like a force to have a reference. So that's why we use this to calibrate it. So calibration complete, and then um, we calibrate the height. So we have to lower it so it doesn't take so much time. Yeah, this is perfect. And um, Okay. 
So it touches the bottom to know like where the, so it uses the bottom as a reference. And so it touches the bottom and goes back to the height you want it set at. And that, that depends on the height of your sample because you're going to place your sample under the probe. All right, so now we, now we have everything calibrated. We can measure the texture of the peanut big square. So um, this probe is like, um, it's mimicking like the teeth, the front teeth. So it's biting into the sample. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the probe is going to lower into the sample. And once it touches the sample, it starts to measure the force needed to break into the sample, as well as the force needed to move through it. How important is it to have it directly in the center as opposed to right on the edge? Well, so, um, that, so, so for your sample, um, most like usually for big samples, the edges are harder. So you get like, a, like more force needed. So that's going to throw off your texture, yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So it draws a graph based on um, the forces needed to move through the sample. So this peak gives you an idea of the force needed to break into the sample, the area under the curve gives you the force needed to move through the sample. So that's like the peanut butter layer. Yeah. The where it dips down. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um so with the force under the curve, that's that that would be more of like the thickness. And so that would be um the force you need to to chew to chew the sample. But for the first peak and the second peak, it's just the force needed to break into the sample. Yeah. Mm. Right, so that's the texture analyzer. Mm -hmm. So then Sorry, how would this, can you uh, compare this to something else? So, so like I mentioned before, this is our control sample mm -hmm. for um, our project in Senegal. So, um, based on the forces we measure here, we would need to have like similar forces for the product we develop. Mm -hmm. Because so, like, what would an, like a cracker look like? A cracker would be would be higher because it would take more force mm -hmm. to break through it. Yeah. Okay, depends on the kind of cracker you're talking about. So when immediately you said cracker, we, um, we, another project we have in this lab is developing um, a lentil cracker. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like um, harder. So yeah. that requires more force. Yeah. And you're using this on the lentil crackers as well? No. Um, so I'm using this cause, um, because we, um, we want to measure like uh, softness. And we, just, we want to know like, and this, is, has, like, um, this has like lots of layers. Mm -hmm. It has like... Um, it has a layer of the peanut paste inside too, apart from just the outer layer. So we want to know like how soft like the teeth, how soft the sample would be when the, like it, like the teeth goes through it, right? So that's why I'm using this probe. But for a cracker, you would use like a different probe. So um, the the selection of the probe depends on the food sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, for for lentil crackers, um, <laughs> we have a number of probes here. So for lentil crackers, um, Sharon, Sharon is an, another guest and she's looking at like the hardness, like the, the snap. So she, she uses this probe. Yeah. That's so, more like the molars. The, the, exactly. Yeah. This, this is designed more like the molars. Oh, yeah. And this is designed more like the front seat. Yeah. Yeah. What's your major? Um, sustainable food systems. Okay. But I did an undergrad in food science. Okay. But that was in Ghana. Okay, yeah. Any more questions? How, how big was the sample size of farmers that Ben said he wanted? Yeah, so um, we did, so we interviewed four communities. It was a lot of work. And we had like, um, we had two focus groups in each community, one with males, one with females. We separated the genders because um, women don't really talk much when the men are around. 
and for the males would would have like um, a maximum of 10 because um, the male farmers are not really not that they were interested but that's not their rule in in the household they don't do like they don't process the food but the women we had like 15 women in some cases we had 30 women coming for the discussion and that was crazy because for a focus group discussion the maximum is 15 mm -hmm. but we had like some groups having 30 women because they were very interested in it they in senegal the women focus on the processing of the peanuts they make peanut paste they make um peanut bars very hard peanut bars that's why they wanted a soft product because they don't have any peanut product that's soft mm. yeah and so um the kids i mean the kids eat um, the peanut paste and the peanut products they have but they, they said their kids would prefer a soft product so that's why we decided to make a soft product yeah Thanks. yeah um any more questions how like rare is this machine like this is a crazy machine i mean like how many are is this well, we had one in Ghana, so I don't yeah. think. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we had one in Ghana, and I actually, actually, I used that for my project in Ghana. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, I, I think it's just um, it depends on the discipline you're in. Because yeah. I'm in food science, I don't think this is so rare. But if you're not in food science, you probably n have never heard of a texture analyzer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to go over the research lab's history and what it's doing with Montana products right now. So starting with Dr. Kuo, she got her bachelor's and master's in Taiwan, it's gorgeous, um, for agricultural chemistry. And then she came to U.S. and the University of Illinois Champaign and got her PhD in food science and human nutrition. When she first came here, she flew into Chicago and she had a salty pretzel. <laughs> and it was the saltiest thing she had ever had. This was her face approximately. <laughs> and um, she'd never had anything so salty before and she did not know why we liked it so salty in America. She got really concerned for our health, obviously, if you're walking around an airport, there's a lot of people that you're kind of concerned about already. And um, so she was thinking, why are people eating like this? What are they doing? And she decided to make her PhD research on the different salt consumption throughout the world. She found that Asia had a much higher salt consumption than North America. So why was this happening? She like thought she'd never had anything so salty before, but clearly there was something going on. She found out in her research that it's not how much salt is in something, it's how quickly it gets to your taste buds. So American salt has been transformed. We have this um, thing going on with it where when you take a bite of something, the salt in that product hits your taste buds 10 times harder and faster than just average salt most places anywhere else. So we like things so salty, but we could not survive with the actual amount of salt it takes to get that taste so fast if it was just a normal. Does that make sense? Different foods are based on different preferences. So the American preference is just we wanted salts to be get to you faster so you didn't have to have so much salt in your food. Um, so he asked if it was an engineering thing for that salt and it is, we can engineer salt, we can engineer every taste to come faster or slower so it can be consecutively slow and you're getting that taste throughout the whole time or it can be one fast hit and when you bite something salty you usually just get an immediate uh, satisfaction of salt it's not slow and if you continue to chew on it you're not going to notice that there's continual salt you're going to just kind of notice that it starts to get blander and blander like i like to think of um, that bubba gum that we used to have as kids and it was just like five seconds of the most immediate flavor and then it was just the driest blandest thing in your mouth dr kuo did her phd and postdoc on sodium reduction she worked with a company in China to reduce the amount of sodium in soy sauce for um, Asian countries because they were getting a lot more sodium than we are. 
and that was a big concern for her. And this is the mean sodium intake of U.S. adults. It is still more than it should be, as we saw over in the last presentation. We're getting about eight to nine grams a day. Men get a bit more than women, but um, it's also dependent on how much they eat. So if you're eating more of something with salt than uh, someone else, then you're going to get more salt. Obviously, they don't, it's not that men are just going for every salty thing imaginable. 2,300 milligrams, five grams. So five grams is the allowance, um, and 2,300 milligrams is a uh, Subway sandwich, I believe. There's the Subway sandwich. Uh, so yeah, it's right around there. And the upper limit is the highest amount you should be having, and the recommended daily average is lower than that. So upper limits are usually where there's health problems associated. This is an example of the sugar consumption in the United States. And it's pretty ridiculous. Does anyone know how much sugar you're actually supposed to have each day? <laughs> well, it's in fruits and it's in some vegetables. It's in healthy foods, so you do need some. You should try to strive for not much added sugars. The amount of sugar you should have is 50 grams. Guess how much is in your average latte at Starbucks? 66. So that's your sugar for the day and your morning coffee. And Americans aren't quite getting that. So we compared, or she compared, uh, one product across different countries and found that in sugar, in Kellogg's Honey Smacks, the density of sugar in these products is higher in America than in other countries, which means it's the same exact product, but the producers are adding extra sugar to help us uh, want to eat it. So if you go to another country, you have the same exact thing, it's going to have less sugar, it's going to taste different, because they don't like the same amount of sugar we do there. I've had a Coke from a few different places, and Coca-Cola tastes nothing like American Coca-Cola from other countries. Like, it's just one of those things that she wanted to see if they were specifically targeting more sugar to get more people buying it here, or if they were just already engineering to Americans' tastes. And that started the Food Product Development Lab. So Dr. Kuo moved from uh, Illinois to Bozeman, and she started this lab in early 2017. We're focused on diverse specialty and indigenous crops. We want to make industrialization of foods here a much easier thing. We want to make sure people understand that made in Montana is just as good as made in California or made in Oregon. We're trying to help people's perceptions of Montana agriculture. And um, we're also working on developing healthier options. So our lentil crackers, which are one of our biggest things right now, the focus of that is to develop a snack, to develop a snack food that has a lower glycemic index and is healthier for you to eat. Farm to Campus Product Innovation. We are working with um, multiple projects that aren't Farm to Campus, but we have three big projects that have been Farm to Campus, and one is coming up farm to campus. So our first one was with Simone Paul. She's recently um, stopped working with the product development lab. Usually researchers do one to one and a half years with us and then move on to another internship. Um, so she was working with Gluten-Free Prairie and we had this gluten-free granola in the dining halls and it was crumbling. It just fell apart so fast. And so Deb with Gluten Free Perry actually contacted us and said, hi, we need a better product, this isn't working. And Simone started to make a gluten free recipe that the granola actually stuck together, which was what we all want when we bite down into a granola bar, essentially. So she had found that um, the sugar in the granola was breaking it up faster, so she started to use agave instead of sugar. And then she played around with the different ratios of agave to sugar in the recipe. And I'm sorry, I have this up here, but it got a little messy. So 
She also changed the consistency of coconut in it. So there were coconut flakes in the recipe and they were pretty small. They ended up falling to the bottom of the bowl and making it look like there was just way more dust than anything in the granola. So she increased the size of the coconut flakes and then we had a lot less breakage. She ended up using this in a study, I believe in March or April of this year. And we did a sensory study, which we explained earlier. We had 110 participants, or, and then it got narrowed down to 98. So uh, sometimes the people who start don't always finish because it takes a little while to get through it. But uh, we had 98 people complete, and the acceptance ratings showed that she had gotten her product right. She developed a recipe with these acceptance ratings and with the texture analyzer. So she was using that a lot. She was one of the first people to utilize the texture analyzer in her research. And then we found out recently that once she gave Gluten-Free Prairie a new recipe, their sales went up dramatically. So she helped to um, get their sales going up. She helped a Montana company, and we really increased our business that way. After that, Dr. Kuo decided to turn this into a class. So she wants students in food and biochemical, chemical engineering, all of these different majors, to be able to study how food product development works. And we're essentially building a course where she will teach um, students to go through their own sensory study. So you work with a company that's in Montana, and you find something that isn't going perfectly in their operations with one of their recipes. And then you're gonna work either with the texture analyzer or with another machine that we've got. Right now we're working on getting an extruder, which um, is about the size of this table. And uh, we are going to have it, we don't know where we're having it yet, but we're working on the extrusion of chickpea pasta. It's gonna be a gluten-free pasta. And that's one of our other machines we've got going. Uh, but we're going to be using those to create new recipes, create new products, or enhance products to make sure that we are just as comparable as other states' companies. And different researchers, such as Katie, who was up here earlier, are going to be mentors in the class. And they're going to teach the class classmates how to develop their project, the steps they need to take, the IRB applications they need to go through. There's a lot of different things involved in doing a sensory study, especially when you're feeding people. So there are a lot of rules, and it's going to be really cool. Everyone's really excited. It's going to start in 2020. And that brings us to Catherine Kautz Scalzone's research. She started working with Katie on the pancake study. So um, she wanted to improve the pancakes, but then she started noticing that she was really interested in sustainability, and she got into Dr. Kulo's pulse research, because pulses are an extremely high source of protein, and they have way less carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, anything bad for the environment. They're much lower than cattle and other sources of protein as our crickets, we're interested in insects as well. Um, so she's going to focus on the development of these pancakes with Montana wheat through Cream of the West. Um, so she's continuing Katie's research in that way. And then she's going to be use, utilizing chickpea flour. Um, and she'll be focusing on the differences in carbon footprints on using chickpea flour versus traditional flour. And then in addition to the product development, She's going to focus on like a bunch of different environmental effects and how utilizing Montana's pulses can benefit the globe. We also have fish smoking happening right now. This is a course, and we're working with the Flathead Reservation. So they are not eating foods that are native to the reservation right now as much as they could be. And there is so much food on the reservation that is just available for grabs all the time. On average, pre-diabetes and diabetes and youth on reservations 
It's about half of the population. In the United States, it's about a third. So it's way higher. Uh, they use a lot of preservatives, and they have a lot of food that's available. So they, uh, Dr. Kuo developed a class that's working with the native fish keepers, and it is, um, they are taking invasive species of lake trout, and we've got a bunch in the freezer right now, and they're using all sorts of spices, herbs, garnishes, Everything is from the reservation. Everything is readily accessible to create these products, and then they're promoting sale of the product at the reservation. So they're trying to kind of increase product knowledge that you can have healthy foods, it is inexpensive, and honestly, you can go fish for it yourself. So it's, it can be free, really. So we're trying to figure that out exactly. So there are different rules with what you are selling. So when you're selling something, you have to have a specific person getting it, or you have to have it analyzed to ensure that you're selling something that can be consumed safely. So it could be foraged as long as it's from a company or people that have certifications to do so. Does that make sense? Right, right. Yeah. So then you run to that sustainability. Yeah, so I couldn't go pick morels and then give them to... Yeah. Um, ale works to sell on their burgers. But if you have like a specific certification or if you're a company, you can do that and be picking the same morels I'd be picking. So there are, yeah, a bunch of different hoops to jump through. And our last project is called How Would You Like That? It is analyzing the views of made in Montana products among campus. So I'm going to be heading a research study, and it will be checking in with questionnaires on different freshmen and sophomores in the dining halls to see what they think made in Montana means. Also, what they think USDA organic means and what carbon neutral means. A lot of people don't really get it, and we found in previous studies that if we place a Made in Montana logo on something, people are actually less likely to purchase it. So we want to increase the nutrition education of exactly what Made in Montana means and that we are just as competitive as all the other states. So we do sensory studies with marketing as well as with our recipes, and we have done multiple studies ourselves. So we have four different or five different samples of the same exact recipe, and we'll put a different label on each one and see what people are most likely to get. And when you compare Made in Montana to No Label, people chose No Label a lot of the time. If you are known for your farming and ranching, then people may not consider you to be producing as much as sending your product out to a producer. And we have in the past, like, um, if you are selling beef to across state lines, then you have to have your beef sent to a producer in another state and that's just a USDA rule. So there are like specific things like that that make agricultural states seem like they're less likely to be doing a good job, but it's just a USDA rule. How, what percentage of MSU students are from Montana versus out of state? That's a big thing that I'm looking into yeah. because I believe the perceptions of Montana are a lot different coming from the outside. I'm also looking at international options, but I'm from Montana and I, uh, I grew up in a 30-person town, and I was actually, before I like looked into this and found all the education, I was less likely to buy something that said made in Montana, just from my experiences. And we've discussed that um, in different focus groups. We've, we want to see exactly what people have seen and see if we can change that perception, because we are doing a lot better, and a 30-person town, which is very common in Montana, isn't the big picture here. Have any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and seeing the food lab. Um, Bill has some presentations for you that are coming up if you want to head over to the kitchens. And I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Our colleagues in uh, Food Enterprise. Uh, food Enterprise is one of the three options within hospitality management, a uh, bachelor's program here on campus. We work with them really closely. We share classes with our students. 
uh, instructors in culinary arts teach some hospitality management uh, courses. Uh, some of their instructors teach our culinary arts courses. So we really work closely together, which is a great collaboration. We love hanging out with these guys and especially the restaurant management option of hospitality management. So today, just to kind of give you a little glimpse of what we do, we're gonna have you step back and uh, hang out with Chef Rick and do a knife sharpening demo, which hopefully is something that's useful for you all. Uh, Danny, one of our second year students, is going to do some knife skills just to give you an idea of what you know our students learn in this program, especially their first year in the program. And then we'll have you get together with our TA, Rebecca, and she's going to show you the kitchen, uh, talk to you a little bit about the dining room, the back dock, just our facility in general. So I will be available for a Q&A after all of that. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. And we'll go ahead and get started. So Chef Rick here is the uh, chef manager for our program. He manages the kitchen operations and he's going to do a demo. And this is Danny, our second year student that's going to uh, help out and kind of give you an idea of what our students are learning in the program. Enjoy. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. So there's nothing worse than a dull night. You know, you end up injuring yourself or somebody standing next to you. Um, you know, so we're going to go over some knife skills. Um, first, I'll tell you. You know, so here I have a butcher knife that I use for big pieces of meat. This is a large chef's knife. This is a smaller one. This is a boning knife. This is another chef's knife. Chef's knife, you know, if you have, it's the one knife that you need. You know, if you're only gonna be, gonna be a one knife person. If you're gonna go into other things like Kara does a lot of butchering of game. Uh, she has multiple, um, but keeping things sharp is super important. Um, here we have a three stone, uh, rough, medium, and fine. Uh, we use the rough for taking down the blade and then polishing it and getting an edge that we can use. This is another version of that. Um, this is something that I, can, that I can use very quickly. And then this is, if I want a super fine, this is way past these. So this is like a 5,000 grain and that's a, like a 7,500 grain. I use water with these, with this stone. Uh, mineral oil, not vegetable oil, not sapphire oil. You want to use mineral oil. The other oils will gunk things up. And so we use this in this application. This is dry, this is wet. Um, so we have 180 degrees, we have 45. And you can actually use two pennies to put it on on the side to get the angle that you're looking for. So Excuse me. So we're going to do some rough passes with this. <laughs> this is Danny's knife. Yeah. Was it dull starting out? So keeping a knife sharp is paramount, you know, for whatever you're going to do. So I've got the de desired texture that or the sharpness that I want. Just going to finish it with a couple strokes here. So with this stone, this is a Dexter stone. Um, it has three different deals. It's supposed to 
mimic uh, Arkansas at the you know for polishing. We're at an angle here, and then we're going to turn it and go to the next. I really like these for you know when I'm butchering legs of veal or elk or mountain lion. Mm -hmm. Have a picture. Of <laughs> and then following it up with something to polish it up with, you know, polish the the graininess that um, you know each stone goes finer and finer and finer. So we can do a finer finer polish on it. We could we could go even finer. Uh, in that direction. Blades have a thing that you have to get a little microscope to look at. It's called a feather. And everybody thinks that this is what you use for sharpening a knife. All this does is straighten the feather. So it keeps, you know, that's it. If you don't have that, The bottom of a plate will work good too for giving you straightening the out. You know, you didn't know that, did you? Mm -hmm. So, if you're at somebody's house and they have a terrible knife, you know, you can try and make up with what you want. Is that to your liking? Oh, yeah, definitely a lot better. So, <laughs> you know, question. So, when you're using these different sharpening, apparatus, um, how often do you need to buy a new one or how would you clean it so that all the metal fragments that are on you there? Could, you could use like a little scrubber, mm -hmm. you know, like one of those green weaves or a uh, porous thing, you know, a little soap and water. You can, you can do that. This will actually fill at the bottom. You can take a look and you can see mm -hmm. that there's shavings in the bottom. So you would clean this, um, you know, for your stuff, Either of these would work well for you. Um, now, there's problems that you will run into. I don't. I didn't bring out a slicer, which is a long, narrower blade. But this boning knife, there's a flaying knife, which is, excuse me, for fish. A chicken knife, uh, boning knife, is similar in looks, but a lot more flexible. And so they will flex more. And so sometimes that is, this is not the best stone for that. This would be something that you'd probably do part of it and then move, move around and get the rest of the stone taken care of. Um, you know, this is good for these knives. They're good and solid, you know, got a lot of steel in them, but the flexing knives you run into problems with, you know, you might get the tip, sharpen or you'll get the body of it and not the tip so it's just one of those things that you know gets you um makes you aware that you know this works out great um, but you have to pay attention to it so you might have to sharpen in two different spots with it um to get the get the sharpness this would be the one and they come in different styles um but they're an investment, and if you do a lot of meat work, you know, either way, you can go. Um, if you want to polish them with a high degree of an edge, you know, the Japanese, uh, this is Global, they're a Japanese company, and um, it works well. One thing I don't have out here is a serrated blade. Serrated blade, you can do on these also. Just kind of straighten it out. You don't have to do a lot with it, but usually uh, if you have the grooves on this side, try and get it on this side and then just a short one across will help straighten out that bread knife for you or you know, if you use it for tomatoes or something else. So any questions on those? Are there sharpening apparatuses that are of low quality that we should avoid? Is there a bar to start at? Um, you know, they have, 
you know, for like our industry, we have people that will come in and sharpen a knife. And they will actually ruin a knife because they put it on a grinder. And they grind it down, and so you're not, your line is not as straight as it used to be. And, you know, I would, you know, go on to own house or something to have them sharpen your knife. I wouldn't suggest that. Um, some of them, you know, the the ones that you have on the counter that you you know that can you run it through. The problem is they work great at first, but then they they deteriorate. They get spongy. The blades different. Each blade sit you know different thickness. You know, so you're you know I'm not a fan of those. Um, I like the flat, the flatness of this, it works well. Um, you know, you can get different stones that have, you know, different combinations. You can leave it wrapped in a rag or in plastic or something like that. And you can do just as well, you know, and I'm not sure what they run. This is expensive, this is like hundred bucks. But, you know, you can find things that work well. I mean, you know, uh, um, those Arkansas, uh, which is a white stone, work well, but those don't have any grit, so you would need something to take it down. Otherwise, you're going to be there for hours polishing that and wrenching that on. Um, some of the diamond stuff, you know, that has a diamond sharpener, I don't really, I, I don't use it. But that's me as a professional. Um, I'm not saying that they don't have their use. But it's something that I'm not into. You know, I I am in this dis direction. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to use. No I'm more walking. Okay, I'm Danny. <laughs> um, I will show you guys some knife skills that we learned in class. And you usually do this your first year student, like the first day <laughs> you learn knife skills. Here's a good one. No, this is good. Okay. What do you think? I just messed it up? <laughs> no. Um, I will show you how to cut up an onion. Oh, a lot cut in half. And I'm just going to dice it. So it's going to be like a julienne first. the other way. I heard that cutting the root off makes like, you know, more likely for you to cry while you're cutting the onion? You're Is that a myth? Yeah, no, I cry all the time. You guys are probably so that's, immune to it. That's it's probably just a like, wives tale. You're gonna cry anyway. Yeah, and they come up with things like, oh, if you do this, like chew gum while you cut up an onion, they say you won't cry, but I've tried that. I still cry. Still cry. Yeah. The it's best impossible. way is to refrigerate your onion. Oh, really? You know, if you're gonna be cutting onions, refrigerate them, pull them out. That'll, you know, it's kind of like wine where and beer. So, you know, you have a cold beer, you get some flavor. You have a warmer beer, all of a sudden you get all kinds of flavor. Same with wine. You have a cold wine, you know, like a white wine, and it's cold, let it warm up more, you get a lot more flavors. How long would the onion have to be in the fridge? You know, a couple <laughs> hours, you know. I would just put it in the morning and just, you know, it should reduce, you know, tears. You know, in the restaurant mm -hmm. industry, we usually don't have that. <laughs> we have to deal with the tears. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then I'll show you how to shift a nod. And I just have some kale here, and I peeled off the stem. And I'm just gonna layer it, and we'll just roll it. I'm gonna roll it pretty tight. And I have like a little roll, and then I'll start working this way. And you want it to be pretty thin, so not very thick. So they do this with basil usually. Mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of the, uh, I mean, the herbs, the chiffonade, you'll see on a menu, chiffonade, uh, basil or chiffonade, uh, chervil or something. And this uh, is red kale from, or purple kale from our local horde farm. So, we is stole it, it. Is it the red Russian variety? No, red Russian's a lot finer. Okay. This is just that pale hay, you know, that you get with kale. Red Russian is so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I have a carrot, and here are some like examples of like different knife cuts. You can pass those around. Yeah, you can. Brought that up for you guys to look at. Um, I will demonstrate a large dice. And it's easier to work with like a smaller piece, especially when you're first starting out, because if you have a huge piece, it's going to be a lot difficult to get that nice cut. And you're going to want to square it off. easier to practice with potatoes because it's a lot easier to get that more square than say a carrot <laughs> and then yeah they're all like weird shaped and this it can be difficult for sure and a large dice we're gonna start out with a big chunk and I'm just gonna square that off a little more Then I'll cut it this way. And that would be your large dice. So it'll be a medium dice. So I just got a little smaller. And then I will do A small dice. And it's always good to have your hand like a claw so you don't cut off any fingers. I've definitely done that before. <laughs> it definitely happens in the restaurant for sure. And then there's one that's called a punois, which will be very small, <laughs> so smaller than the small dice. And then you can go finer, yeah. much finer than that. Mm -hmm. Why don't awesome. you tell them, where do you work? Oh yeah, so I work at Montana Ale Works. I don't know if you guys know that place. Mm -hmm. you probably do, it's very popular. It's very big. Um, I started as a line cook on soups and salads and desserts, which is just cold foods. You work with cold More foods. More garbage, eh? Yeah, it's very easy. You know, you work with that first and you can work your way up the line. And then I worked my way up. I've moved about, let's see, one, two, three, four, about five to six stations. And this kitchen is really huge. So we have probably 12 stations. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> and so far I've learned how to work with hot food. So I've worked with fryers. I've been on burger stations um flat top stations i haven't worked my way up 
that far yet because I've only been there for about a year. And, you know, it takes time to learn each station, you know, work your way up. Um, I also worked as a prep crew, a prep chef. So that's early shifts. So 6 a.m. to 3, whenever you're done with your list. Um, there I learned a lot of knife skills, a lot. Since I was doing cold line prep work, we cut a bunch of veggies. So it definitely helped me a lot over the summer to work on my knife skills for sure. I, when I first started, it was kind of rough <laughs> for sure. And then I was more consistent on it. I got better. I even got compliments by my chefs and coworkers of how well they, I have improved on them. Um, and even one day when I started out doing chiffonade, I had them too big and my chef came back and told me, and it showed me an example of how it should look. And then I worked from there and it improved for sure. Um, how many meals do you guys do there? Um, how many covers? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> a lot. On a busy night, we have 900 covers. Mm. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's always fast paced. Mm. You're always working fast. You're always busy. You don't really have a lot of downtime. Mm -hmm. So when you do, it's good to get like a drink of water in or take a break and step in the cooler because it gets really hot in the kitchen. <laughs> I sweat a lot during, during the whole time. Um, we usually have, let's see, just the back of house, we have probably 15 to maybe 20 people working a night. Front of house, it's probably about the same as well. So during the whole night, we have maybe 30 to 40 people working. Yeah, that's a lot. How has the school been in conjunction in tandem with your work? Um, when I first started out, so I started in October, so exactly one year ago, working at Aleworks. During that time, I was very new to the kitchen, um, just in the restaurant business and for school. So when I would work at Aleworks, it, I learned stuff there from other people like hacks and stuff like how to make it easier on yourself how to be faster at it then when it came to doing kitchen work here during school time i used that knowledge to help me in the kitchen as well instead of having to learn harder way or slower at it it definitely helped me a lot um especially more with more techniques here yeah Technique's a very big thing. That's what I've tried to improve on. Still improving on it. Just gotta stay consistent with it, and I am trying that. And I've definitely gotten better. Um, I've noticed I'm not very loud in the kitchen, so me working at that restaurant has made me become louder and made me communicate better in the kitchen with my students as well. She's our resident wallflower. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have any questions or anything? Are you going to demonstrate something with the potato? Um, Go ahead. I can. I can just show you some more knife <laughs> work. Do some um, batons, you know, the sticks. All the yeah, stuff. little sticks. I think they're called batonets. Yes, batonets. And how yeah. much lemon in that quantity of water? Um, I did about three wedges. Just put it in there. It doesn't really take a whole lot. As long as you have some acid in there. You know, don't Watching you do this is making me realize how dull my knives are. <laughs> yeah. So, it's you know, investing in something like this or, <laughs> you know, whatever you can will make a big difference, you know, and it's, it's a safety issue. Yeah, I yeah. It's keeping you safe. I know it, I know it. Okay, so that one was the button A. Now I'm going to do a Julian, which is smaller.
Does the lemon water affect the flavor of those potatoes? Well, so if we were going to, you know, blanch them and then fry them, you know, in the fryer, it's not. Oh. I could even go even smaller. To, I could try that. <laughs> You could do something like this, like what she's doing, but with chives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you do them at a little bit of an angle. We call them batons, you know, batons of, of chives. You know, so a lot of this, these knife skills, um, you know, soups, you know, if you're going to make some soups, um, even with the potatoes, the onions, um, whatever you're going to use turnips you know you, all your root vegetables would be great you know in a chicken soup you know you could you could take these you could take the potatoes diced up you can take uh the onion added to it you can take you know four chicken tenders cut them put them in a pan with what you know cold water you know bring them to a simmer uh, salt and pepper add fresh cilantro to it, you know, chili fly, flakes, hang on chicken soup. Very simple. What do you do with the waste? The waste would go probably into the carrots and those would go into yeah. chickens or into a stock. We'd use them for making a stock, vegetable stock, field stock, chicken stock, whichever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to keep just sticking in a cooler, keep it and if you want to make stock or even just Chicken noodle soup, you have your base right there, so. I'm sure that you have something like that over, you have a pile mm -hmm, yeah, we at have. the kitchen there that they mm -hmm. they collect anything that's left over yeah. and they'll use it for stocks. And we have compost, so that's, that's really good that we have that. We try to stay on top of those. So the food you order for this program, is that done like just in conjunction with like the campus cafeteria and it's all this? We, we're by so ourselves. We, okay. We're like lone wolves. We are, we're screwed. Gotcha. You know, we, <laughs> we take care of ourselves. You know, um, we're not part of the other system. This is an educational. Mm -hmm. You know, um, all of the other food services are for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, we're for a deficit. You know, we purchase food. You know, Bill is phenomenal at setting up the coursework. So each class has, you know, different things that are required. So we don't, we buy some things in bulk, but some things we don't, you know. Um, if we have, you know, one class has 16, another class has 16, we can get 30 chickens, mm -hmm. you know, where they learn how to bowl. But, mm -hmm. You know, we, we gear it all towards, you know, the class and the session. Consumes all of the food. Excuse me? Who consumes all of the food you prepare in classes? The students um, and others? We have tasting panels. So when we prepare something or make something for one class, we have tasting panels. And we invite people to come over and mm. taste our food to give us feedback. And people live here, right? Yes, this is a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but we're Just ring the bell. cut off yeah. from them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that okay. takes care of our deal. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you good so job. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is our dining hall area. We share it with the female dorm. That's the rest of the building. Uh, we have sometimes banquets out here. We might have a tasting panel that comes in for our class. And so they will come out here. And then uh, where you guys were just looking is where we set up our dishes to have other students take a look at them and uh, have the chefs review them. Um, this is typically where we start in the morning. This is where we have our lecture before class begins. So we could be out here for an hour or two covering recipes and the chapter. And then we tend to just go from there right into the kitchen. It's a five hour day starting usually at 8 a.m. And then we're done about one on hopefully, <laughs> depending on how many dishes we have to do. Uh, so through here, we're gonna actually just 
walk through the kitchen and I'm gonna uh, just talk you through what's in there. So our sausage stuffers, we've got fermentation, all of the things that we need back here. Uh, we also have this chamber right here, so we'll use this a bit more for when we do our dairy and culture. And so we will have this set up and a humidifier going inside of there. We'll start here, sanitizing everything and then going back into the kitchen and setting it up to, to stuff it. So this is this section back here. Our kitchen is a mix of brand new and a little bit of some 50s things. So we have some things that work flawlessly and some things that are needing a little extra love. Uh, this is our baking corner behind you. And so this we will use quite a bit when we have our baking and pastry class, which will be next semester for second year students. So we have all of our baking, our flour, rolling pins, all the things that we need over in this corner. And we like to keep things where they should be. So that's our biggest thing with students, is put things back when you found it or ask. So uh, that's kind of probably our biggest hurdle for first year students of finding interesting things and interesting choices. Uh, <laughs> this one we've used for uh, pizza class recently. So this cranks up to at least 600 degrees. So we put our pizzas in there and we'll use it for bread as well. Brand new convection oven, that's also a new um, machine. Each uh, station, depending on the size of class, my class is second year, so we've got a smaller class, we're into it. But the new classes can have 19 to 20 students. And that makes it for a very busy kitchen. So they will pick an area that they want to work at and then they have everything they need located underneath each area. So there's a spatula, there's a tongs, measuring spoons, measuring cups. So that's all located and the students need to clean everything, put it back and stock it. Um, and then we just split the kitchen up so we can use the ranges over here, the flat top, and then students will use that side of the kitchen uh, as well. So if you'll follow me, that's where we're going to be washing produce or uh, if we need to handle meat or anything, keeping everything really sanitized. Back here is our, here our mini grocery store that has all of our spices and baking ingredients are all back here, including our vacuum pack machine. So we will use this often. Uh, this will be for extra things that we don't use during the class or that come in and we want to freeze it. It'll go downstairs. We have everything in sections. So we come in here often to put things back where they should go. Uh, but we keep this fully stocked. We get lots of orders that come in. We share it with the food lab. We share it with Marcy's dietetics class and her medicine class. So uh, there could be a few people back here uh, using all these ingredients, but the cooking classes will come back and have access to nuts, seeds, grains, all these oils and then if there's anything that we request we can always put on the board or ask the chef if we can get something in and we have our ice machine and then we are able to cook with wine and some liquors which is in a locked container right there right behind you uh, and if we go out into the kitchen we go back out into the kitchen Ooh. Oh, we have lots of interesting posters oh, I'll take a picture of that map. yeah absolutely have please to do feel that. free and we have more out there as well so out here we have overflow of cooking utensils that we need. We've got cookie sheets and everything has a home. And so that's the biggest thing that we have to learn as students is to make sure that things go back because it runs differently than our kitchen at home. And we have to be really mindful of other people in the kitchen and using certain words behind, sharp, corner, because uh, it's, a, it's a place that you can get hurt. So that's really important that we go over with the students. Uh, this is our small smoker. I was Wani Wen's intern for the summer, so I smoked a lot of trout uh, for her class that she has and is still working with her class right now. And we're doing recipes, but this is where I spent a lot of my summer with. <laughs> this is our chef's table, so we have demos. This is where the chef's going to begin. We're going to show night cuts, and then we can, of course, look up there at what's happening and surround the area, and then they just come over here and they might show us something on the range as well. These are more stations where students will set out their station. They each have a drawer, so there's 10 items in each drawer that need to go back. Lots of cutting boards, uh, basically anything that you need. The mix of some new things and some old things. Behind you is a really big walk-in refrigerator. 
and it's very generous in size for the class teaching class that we have. All right, so if we go into the hallway back here, this is another access for the students to come in if they wanted to come from the dock sign. They just need their cat car to swipe and come in that way. But that's where we have our recycling garbage. Uh, if we have oil, that's where we dispose of it. There is a drum out there. And if we have like the fire marshal comes, so we do a demo. So we set things on fire in the bathroom, which makes things interesting. Uh, downstairs, we have a walk-in freezer and extra storage rooms. And that's also part of my job to make sure that that's organized. So we have lots of overflow. When we need things or we have an event that comes up, we'll go downstairs, grab those things, take it to the events, and just keep track of everything. And this is our job board as well. As you can see, we have lots of cutting boards. Uh, we've got beautiful platters to use for presentation, because that is what we're laying on. Yeah, mixing bowls as you can imagine, but for a bigger class, a lot of those will disappear and we'll end up in the dish room. So that's where things will get interesting. This is our dish room. And the uh, cover is uh, an oldie but a goodie. So it is a loud, it is steamy in here. <laughs> it does uh, get a little temperamental with us sometimes, but it works great. And we just have a flow in the kitchen, or in the kitchen, and also in the dish room that we really um, like to maintain for the safety of students that come back here, and uh, also to keep clean side clean, dirty side dirty, and we sanitize everything at the end of each class. Um, this is a, sort of the rite of passage happens in this room of students coming in and seeing a pile of dishes and how quickly they need to get it done during the class time. Uh, this is probably one of the top areas where uh, a student can get hurt because the floors are really slippery when that is going, so surfaces and shoes are imperative when you come to class uh, and you're in the dish room. The student lunches can go in there, there might be some leftovers that students can then be able to consume, but that's really what this is for. Or if we're working with charcuterie, then... And we have our charcuterie items in here, across the stage shelf. So, uh, I feel like I've covered, we got our sanitation over here, and we're in there. So, that's our kitchen. What food safety certification? Do you know how to calibrate it? We do a, uh, like a safe sanitation class. Okay. And so that Marcy teaches that one, Marcy guest on. So she teaches that it's a whole semester. Okay. And then we take the test uh, so awesome. during the class time. But we've got instructors that are here walking through, uh, they catch something and it's addressed immediately. So there's a kitchen like has certified and like serve safe and what's like that? It's serve safe certified, but we don't really have HACCP plants gotcha. because we're not feeding the public. Right, we, right. We'll do like a tasting panel, yeah. but that's different than if we were like taking money for someone coming in so they wanted to eat something. So it's, it is a different. Um, parameters that we follow. Right. We do have copies of the HACCP plan in the back. Any other Thank questions? You. Those safety words that you mentioned, because of how many throughout the state, yeah. is that different kitchen to kitchen and this is the business? You know, it should be something that is, is pretty good for every kitchen. Uh, it takes a little bit of being used to, because it's, it's a little strange when you are having to announce yourself going through the kitchen, and then you end up, I do, doing it in the grocery store behind, and then the what's happening, but you just get so used to it. It's a great thing for, to, to, we really push that. Um, for safety reasons, you're holding knives, sharp set, it's hot, and it's good to get used to it, especially when there's over 20 students in here. It's really important, so. Uh, so, 
Farm and Campus Coordinator. Uh, so my primary job is working with a lot of the different local producers from throughout the state, whether they're a farmer, rancher, food manufacturer, grabbing and collecting their information, bringing it back to our chefs and managers here. Or when one of our chefs or managers has an inquiry about a local product, uh, I can either provide them that information or go out into the marketplace and try and find something or work with one of the companies that we're already partnering with to try and develop a new product um, or improve something. And so we'll talk about a few examples of that, including some of the stuff that we've been working on with the Food Development Lab. Um, but for our Farm to Campus program here at MSU, um, 10, 15 years in the making now in terms of really ramping up the amount of local focus that we have within all of our operations. And so our culinary services, we're a self-operated food service. Um, we're not a management company, but we're just self-operated food service. And so that provide, provides us the ability to do what we want, including have a really having a really strong local focus. Whereas if you had a contracted food service management company, which a lot of universities or institutions or hospitals do with a Marriott, Bon Appetit, um, all those different companies, then they often have um, like programs in place. It, it's more similar to a franchise. And so it's like, if you went to a McDonald's, you don't, and like now you're an owner of a McDonald's, you don't just get to put on like local veggie mushroom right. sandwich, like they have everything in place. So uh, we don't do that. Uh, so here we do all the food on campus, including our two dining halls. We're at Rendezvous Dining Pavilion right now, which is a newly constructed building last year. So this is the second year that it's been up and running. And then we have Miller Dining Commons, which is our other dining hall. So if you're on a meal plan on campus, you would eat in these two different facilities on the meal plan. Uh, we also have retail food up in the sub, which we met at this morning. So they have pizza, pasta, grab and go, coffee, uh, things like that. Uh, we have a catering department for any meeting that happens on campus. Um, and including if you guys are in, in the conference, like the breakfasts and dinners, that will be provided through our catering department. We have concessions at our football stadium and field house uh, for any athletic events or concerts, or rodeo, school events that happen up there. And then we also have a production commissary kitchen where a lot of our baked goods, whether they're muffins, rolls, breads, cookies, or salads come out of. So quinoa salad, pasta salad, um, cut up fruit, they go onto our fruit, fruit plat platters and everything like that. Uh, so those are our main areas of operation. So I get to work with all of those different people. So for campus, um, on an annual basis, we spend about a quarter of our food budget um, on Montana foods. So last year we spent $2 million um, on Montana source foods, and that's uh, any foods from the state of Montana, whether it was grown here, raised here, or manufactured. So whether it's beef, carrots, or locally brewed kombucha, or locally roasted coffee, any of those food products coming from within the state, we will um, code into our accounting systems for local purchases. 25% of your budget is for Montana foods. Mm -hmm. Has that changed that percentage over time? Significantly. So 15 years ago, we didn't really do too terrible much. That's when we really made a strong concentrated effort to say, hey, this is something that we're gonna do. Started bringing in a few really easy options. And then over time, access to local foods has improved significantly. Uh, and our overall willingness and understanding of how to work with our local distribution channels and outlets has improved, pricing has improved, the number of companies in the marketplace has increased, so significantly increased since then. And that change 15 years ago, was that driven from students, from administration, from both? Combination of things. Um, MSU is our land grant institution from Montana, or in Montana, traditionally established as the College of Agriculture. So, being that and being in Montana as a really agriculture focused state, um, because we didn't do a lot of those things, there was some pressure from the top saying, hey, you guys need to start increasing your local purchases, um, but also the availability of it significantly improved. And so we could do it at that point. What would you contribute the more available local foods to those individual businesses, partnerships, uh, third parties that are working on all of it? All of it, mm -hmm. yeah. So the local food movement nationally has gained a ton of traction. 
which in turn has brought more companies to the marketplace. Uh, we have more distribution at this point with established distributors in the state. Montana is an incredibly difficult state to distribute to because we are so large with such a small populace that getting products from the eastern side of the state and bringing them here or even bringing them from western Montana, it just doesn't pay off for a distributor standpoint. So that is really hard, but we have some companies that are making a go at it and they're just like, we're going to do it and eventually it's going to pan out. So, so all things. <laughs> So uh, I know that the culinary program was, has been a couple of years old. How long have, like, have we had a farmed campus program? So 10, 15 years. Okay, so that's what Yeah, so now. it started out as a student position, America Revista position, and then transitioned into a per permanent position. And so I've been in this role for the past three years, um, and just it's evolved to the point where it is now. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're, and your main focus is like, basically getting more local foods into the regular cycle of whatever you do. Yep. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah. Do you work with any of the other colleges like uh, Missoula? They have a program like this also. They do have a farming college program there where they are focused on the same things. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you communicate? And... Yeah, and we're able to work together to um, work on specific products or specific vendors to help make it so that we have access to both of them or like commit to saying that like, we're going to use this product they're going to use this product and then cisco can like onboard that company because without one or the other of us the usage would be too small but they're not going to stock it for the distribution center there um so yes we do work with them do other, do other campuses aside from the two big ones two big universities have the ability to benefit from those that purchasing power that the two big ones have. Yeah, so this past year, uh, working for a state institution, we have RFP, uh, so we have solicitation and purchasing requirements that we have to go through. And so our main, our primary distributor, Cisco, we are on a joint contract with UM on that. And we decided to do that together for the first time to be able to leverage um, a better contract for the both of us. And so with that, in turn, our auxiliary colleges can take advantage of that contract and they can purchase from Cisco with the same pricing and, same, and things like that too. So who would, um, would who would tell those, like the college in Kalispell, who would communicate with them to tell them about what you're doing? Uh, I mean, our, we, we all work together with the food service industry, yeah. Uh, and it kind of depends on how far removed they are from MSU or UM and, and, and also like where they're placed in relation to the Cisco distribution center and things like that. Um, but we do help some of the other colleges. And so recently um, we have our Cisco contract. We had a contract with Meadow Gold that has all their milk from within the state of Montana. We found out that Cisco has the same Montana milk through Cisco with significantly better pricing. And so we recently transitioned from purchasing it direct from Meadow Gold, and now instead we're purchasing it from Cisco. There's a college up in Haver that they were purchasing from Meadow Gold. We told them, hey, you can now get better pricing from Cisco. So they started doing that, but it was not to their benefit because they were getting milk that was dated three days out. Mm -hmm compared to being able to purchase it direct from Meadow Gold. And so we work with them to help get uh, a contract in place so that they could purchase it direct from Meadow Gold again, even though we don't have that contract. So this is getting super muddy and like unnecessary, I feel like. Um, but we, we are able to work with sure. um, a lot of the other colleges and places. And the, our, our purchasing volume too helps those companies be able to distribute to other places. And so for instance, there's like, company called Root Cellar Foods that's based out of Belgrade and they're a vegetable processing company. They'll purchase vegetables from throughout the Gallatin Valley and then they'll wash, they'll peel, they'll shred, slice, dice, whatever it is um, to be able to get a raw agricultural product and turn it into a ready to eat product that we can just open the bag and pour it out onto our buffet line. We'll pour it right into a recipe. That established company without our buy-in and purchasing volumes 
wouldn't be able to have gotten to the scale that they're at so that they can then provide product to L Works and provide product to these small catering companies and provide it to our local retail uh, grocery stores and things. And so our volumes help companies like those so that they can like put their tentacles into these smaller other companies that can benefit from the fact that there's a large volume being placed elsewhere. That's great. So, That's good stuff. Could you give like a brief summary of like where you're sourcing all the local foods? So Cisco, is that like a, you know, like like 80% of that? And then like you guys work with Root Cellar Foods to get your food from them too? Like who are the vendors and how many? Yeah, so the majority of our purchases uh -huh. come from Cisco. Yeah. Um, but the majority of our local purchases do not. Yeah. So Cisco does stock local products and we get things like uh, Amalfi of goat cheese, which mm -hmm. is a farm that's located in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. So Cisco carries their product, um, or we can get some Wheat Montana products. We can mm -hmm. get all of our fluid milk. Um, we can get some other products from Cisco, but then we have other local distributors, um, Quality Foods Distributing, which is based out of Bozeman, that stocks hundreds of Montana products, that we can get a lot of products that it's yeah. Not as easy, but almost as easy as ordering with Cisco, mm -hmm. where our chefs can go directly to the computer and check everything off that they need from Cisco and place the order and get it delivered tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, QFD aggregates all of those local products and we can place an order like that with them for a lot of local goods. They don't distribute to us as frequently, mm -hmm. so it does complicate our system some. Um, we have another company in town called Summit Distribution that they focus um, primarily on proteins and mm -hmm. specialty foods. So we get a lot of our Montana meats and things like that from them, um, which is nice and convenient. And then we do a lot of direct one-off mm -hmm. orders like uh, Root Cellar Foods, Ranch Land, mm -hmm. which is uh, all of our um, meat and beef, um, and then like Vouch Potatoes were ordered direct from um, and they'll do all their own distribution. Um, but then there'll be other companies that we place an order from and they might ship it to us in the mail. And so like Tumblewood Teas, they're a, a craft batch, hand blended tea company of Big Timber. Mm -hmm. We'll place an order with them and then they'll ship it to us in the mail. Mm -hmm. Or Cornetopia, which is a gourmet candy popcorn company in Missoula. We'll place an order with them, they'll ship it to us in the mail. Um, but all of these things are additional small, yeah. like, things to remember right. from the chef's perspective yeah. that makes it more difficult, mm -hmm. but it, overall it improves the quality of our service and our operations. And so it's figuring out and building those systems so that things don't get lost mm -hmm. um, and that they actually... Where do you get your cooking oil? Cooking oil? Uh, the oil barn up in Big Sandy. Uh, so it's safflower oil. Yeah, so um, do you recycle that right. and pick up the old oil? So they don't because uh, we have a recycling company over in Four Corners, which is just 10 miles away from here, that recycles it. Um, and it's more cost efficient for them to do that than to have Big Sandy come all the way down and then bring it back up. But it does get recycled into biodiesel. So That's good. Thank you. Yeah. That's really helpful. That's so cool. Yeah. So that, that one's a really cool one, and I'm really happy about that because there are so few fat producing companies within the state right. or like in general and so yeah. being able to have a local fat manufacturer in the state is really awesome and then being able to use it on such a large scale right. so we use it all of our fryers for all of our fries chicken fingers onion rings um things like that mm -hmm. and so it's a pretty tremendous amount that we get we get a pallet delivered to each dining hall um, basically at least once a month so wow. a lot that's of good oil. <laughs> okay so that's basic overview we can start going through here and then we'll eventually eat um but as we're walking in um 111 is our coffee shop and there's a retail component and there's also uh, a dining hall component and so as you're going into the dining hall um if you don't want to pay the cash rate or if you're not on a meal plan to go into the dining hall can come into this coffee place and just order a coffee and then go back onto campus. Uh, so we have a little bit of weird marketing things that we need to do with that to increase traffic flow here because it seems like you have to go through the dining hall. But anyways, the cool thing with um, 
the coffee shop here is that because it's connected to the dining hall, and in the dining hall we have all reusable serviceware for plates, silverware, cups. Um, we don't have any disposables. We don't have any to-go options for clamshells or anything for the food. Um, that same reusable initiative was extended into the retail component of this coffee shop. And so we only have reusable mugs in here for coffee. So you either come in and you bring your mug, or if you don't, what we've done to uh, offset that is collecting cups from throughout the community, whether it's a travel mug or a ceramic mug, we put calls for donations out. Um, we collect them, we inspect them, sanitize them, and then you would are just provided a mug if you came in and you didn't know that we don't have paper cups to go. Um, and so there's been no paper mugs that come out of this place, which is a, a pretty cool uh, accomplishment for us here on campus. So yeah. that's the Do you have an estimate and how many, how much um, paper you've not wasted? Uh, we we have kind of bad on that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious. Thousands at this point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we can come in and then. We just put it in those bins there and then it gets taken. Um, facility services here on campus. I'm not walking in here. Uh, facility services actually comes, collects it, throws it all into this giant roll off dumpster, which is like the size of basically this room here. Um, and then the city of Bozeman comes, picks that up about once a week, brings it over to the convenience site, and they do the composting there. And so there, all of our food waste gets ground up and mixed with wood chips and some partially composted material and then gets ground together and then shoved into a big ag bag system. So those are those big uh, giant plastic caterpillars on the ground. Um, they have some air that gets shot through it, um, sits there, composts, and then it gets like moved all around. And then that finished compost gets put back onto the city of Bozeman landscaping um, and then some other campus stuff too. Um, so yeah, last well, year- it does last go in the compost? The hopefully trash yeah. but a lot of trash does uh, but we've all food goes in there yeah um last year we diverted over half a million pounds of food waste from all of our campus operations um that was previously going to the landfill and then they got diverted away and we still have some more room for improvement for collecting from all of our operations uh, we're not there yet but um, so this is one dry storage location. There's another one down the hall, but it's, we're not going to go down there. Um, so here's dry storage here. Um, and then we can go back upstairs. Um, but what's kind of interesting to me is that this is all the food. And so there's, there's going to be walking coolers upstairs too um, that we have. And then there's going to be coolers at each of the individual unit concepts to be able to use on them. But all the food that we see in here um, this is all just for rendezvous. Uh, it's replicated basically the same over in Miller. So a tremendous amount of food over there. And then food up in the sub for catering and retail and concessions. Um, and then also the bakery. So there's just a tremendous amount of food here. Um, that I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, more. 
freezers in here, another walking cooler. Um, so things just get staged everywhere. Yes, it's cold. I 